Welcome to the ITU studio in Geneva, where I'm very pleased to be joined in the studio today by Anastasia Lauterbach, who is the author of The Artificial Intelligence Imperative, uh, international technology strategist, advisor, and entrepreneur, and also non-executive director of three major companies. Welcome to the studio. Thank you so much for having me. Now, I'd like to, to start off by talking a little bit about the transforming power of AI in today's society and how this impacts policymakers and regulators. So artificial intelligence is one of the most powerful uh, technologies on this planet. Uh, so it's not surprising that uh, technical luminaries such as Andrew Eng compare it to electricity. Um, Andrew uh, has uh, been uh, with AI for many, many years. Uh, he co-founded Coursera, where you can learn about uh, AI online. And he's just created a fund to invest uh, in artificial intelligence. It's a quite a powerful fund for machine learning uh, startups. He's not very concerned about uh, AI being a force for evil. Uh, he's comparing this to like, I'm not concerned about overpopulation on Mars, so I'm not concerned about Terminator coming and destroying all, all of us. But um, the point is that artificial intelligence is something tremendously practical. It's getting embedded everywhere. It doesn't matter whether you are in medical profession or in manufacturing or maybe even in agriculture, you will have to deal with ar artificial intelligence applications. So if uh, internet uh, has already disrupted uh, approximately 20% of global economy, why uh, e-commerce, uh, frontline applications, uh, customer, consumer-facing applications, AI will transform the rest. So that means that 80% of the economy is getting uh, transformed by artificial intelligence as we speak here. Right now, the AI is still not very, very intelligent. So some scientists compare uh, its intelligence to an intelligence of a four years old. Other are more optimistic, they're talking about seven years old, but uh, for example, Jan LeCan, who leads uh, AI at Facebook, he's just believing that AI has an intelligence of a rat. And still, it's disrupting so many businesses. Among uh, top 10 uh, most valuable companies on this planet, uh, there are five brands which are all about artificial intelligence. And those are our traditional suspects, Alphabet, uh, together with Google, of course, uh, Apple, Microsoft, Amazon, and Facebook. Uh, so those companies uh, are so-called full-stack AI companies. So what does it mean? They invest in their own semiconductors. So they don't go to Intel or Qualcomm's of this world and buy from them, but they invest to actually design their own, to control the experience. They control their own cloud, and of course they have a vast amounts of resources and a huge developer community and ecosystem system to go after applications and services. And uh, they combine the R&D with real-time applications and services. Most scientists who are very famous in machine learning and deep learning actually work at those companies. And simultaneously, they work at universities and bring fresh talent to those companies. So human resources, ca is human capital is everything in this world of the future machines. It's very important who you are getting. And it's not surprising that right now uh, many people are thinking about diversity in artificial intelligence research, development, uh, and actually practical applications. So famous Fei Fei Li, who is a scientist with Google and with Stanford, uh, she is uh, a co-founder of a network called AI for All. Together with Melinda Gates, they want to attract girls uh, of the age of uh, 14, 15, 16 to the world of deep learning and machine learning. They are attracting uh, those uh, school girls uh, to something which might become one day a next generation of AI practitioners. And that's tremendously important because uh, AI has a capability to scale everything uh, we are about as humans. And so if you have a team of, let's say, only white male developers, or let's say, only Chinese male developers, then you will get a data set and some algorithms who will be just wired according to preferences, habits, uh, and just uh, thinking processes of those groups. Uh, so those uh, data sets and algorithms will miss uh, a huge chunk of the world and uh, we will get uh, in automation which will not correspond to the whole world. And that might be very dangerous, especially if we are, for example, in financial services, if we are in education, who is, for example, deciding on whether your kid will get admission to a college? 
or who is deciding whether you will uh, get admission to a so certain social uh, security program. So the inequality might uh, be a uh, nation just because those teams of developers are um, not very diverse and they are biased. Then they are, there is an issue of artificial intelligence which is quite close to what I do who work and this is around adversarial attacks on machine learning applications and algorithms. Unfortunately, like every technology being neutral, AI uh, is getting into the hands of criminals. And this is something regulators really need to uh, be smart about, uh, think about and observe. So right now you can, for example, uh, hack into the uh, real um, time data stream and change the perception of a sensor. So the sensor will see a stone instead of an animal, like a raccoon, or uh, a stone instead of a kid. This is highly dangerous. Uh, if uh, you have voice authentication systems, right now with the power of machine learning, you can actually fake voices and you can fake eyes, irises of people to actually mislead uh, systems, uh, sensors, uh, machines, and even people. If you are, for example, on the phone and uh, receiving a call uh, by a robot, but you think it's a real person. So there's a huge new world of issues uh, coming at us. Uh, and the question is, how do we mitigate the risks and how we are getting better? Last but not least, there is one thing where I believe that regulators need to exercise um, regulatory humility. And uh, this is around the fact that uh, there is nothing, let's say, intelligent about current uh, machine learning um, systems. Uh, everything happens by design. And uh, who is in charge of design? It's in principle humans. But uh, there are systems um, dealing with deep learning technologies which uh, might be perceived as black box systems because human engineers can't actually reverse engineer them to explain every single step why, for example, a system came to one conclusion or to another conclusion. So what is happening there is that regulators sometimes say, well, uh, if it, that's a black box, then we can't control it, so we just can't allow for such systems to be used. But AI is nothing static, so there are changes uh, on a weekly basis. Uh, for example, NVIDIA right now, this is a semiconductor giant uh, who actually established this GPU technology for AI uh, processing. Um, this company developed a technology which colors uh, certain parts in a data set and algorithms to make it more, let's say, recognizable for a human eye on what pieces uh, of, let's say, a data set or a code were predominant in making one or another decision. So this is, of course, not a true reverse engineering to 100%, but it's a path, and we are on a path. And um, something which is very close to my heart is that we need to invest into fundamental research to be better with mathematics, which are the base of artificial intelligence. Because let's not forget that Google is actually mathematics from the 30s and AI is mathematics from the 40s and 50s. So uh, s things like, for example, swarm algorithms, a swarm uh, data analysis, that might lead us to the path where we will understand how this black box works or, or not there might be other paths but that's uh, something which is tremendously important so for me artificial intelligence just to kind of you know in a nutshell is a force right now it's getting used by uh, the most valuable companies in the world but it gets embedded into all kind of businesses into our society and of course it has impact on everything we do uh, be it uh, education, be it health care, be it social care, be it defense. So this is something we are going to live with. And I'm not a huge believer that we will uh, have another AI winter uh, because uh, we just have uh, so many resources and so many people and companies interested in this technology. It will never stop. Now, I mean, that's all fascinating stuff. We've, we've had... Uh, over the last couple of days, regulators sitting in, in that chair quaking. Uh, yeah. They're quite, quite nervous about the future because they can't really get up to speed and, and they don't know whether they're ever going to be able to get up right. to speed. So I just wanted, wanted to find out from your perspective, what's the answer to this? Do they have to have uh, technologists sitting side by side with them? Uh, are, they, um, are they in a position basically to be able to regulate for uh, such, a, such a future that we have ahead of us? 
Look, um, I think that those regulators are not alone uh, being uh, kind of uh, confused and maybe even afraid uh, about what might come and about how to do their job. Uh, corporate bosses are in the same uh, shoes, uh, even if they run uh, multi-billion dollar companies and uh, corporate boards are in the same shoes uh, themselves. So I quite often observe that uh, people who are so skilled in uh, deciding uh, about mergers uh, and you know some compliance rules and governance, they don't understand technology. And this is because governance rules um, were defined as backward looking rules. So something uh, from the past, which was the experience, got more or less progressed uh, uh, into the future. And then uh, people said, okay, it happened in the past, we will not allow this to happen again um, in the government, but uh, let's say in the company as well, in the corporation. So uh, having technologists helps. Uh, however, you need translators. So translating from English to English, from German to German, French to French, people who can translate technology. So none of the technologies is a Swiss knife. Uh, so you need multiple faces around the table uh, to argue the piece of a technology stack. It's good if someone, let's say, is a more strategic and can kind of you know combine from the semiconductor up to the application layer and say, look, uh, this this might impact this group of a population or that group of population or maybe this uh, set of uh, companies. That's something very important. But ultimately, I believe in teamwork and uh, in uh, interdisciplinary approach. Um, if you read uh, through uh, AI scientists, you might see that uh, many of them are talking about philosophers, cognitive scientists. Um, and neurobiologists uh, who will contribute to the nation uh, world of AI. Of course, we are already uh, 60 years uh, into this world, but uh, we're still very, very young. And we need input of multiple groups uh, in uh, society, in industry, uh, and in regulatory work uh, to contribute to the world we actually want to have, instead of just like uh, complaining and expecting what might happen. If we just uh, lean back and expect, bad things might happen b because of the lack of diversity, because of uh, some bias with certain um, maybe companies, even with certain countries, what is good for one country will not necessarily be great for another country. So we need uh, some platforms to exchange and I ultimately believe that uh, we need uh, to provide knowledge on artificial intelligence to all groups of the society. So if uh, a regulator uh, is let's say living somewhere in let's say Geneva. Uh, he's not just a regulator, he's a member of the community, he, uh, he's a father, um, he's a husband, uh, he's a brother. Uh, so maybe it's quite good to reach out to the local school and ask uh, what do you do around artificial intelligence and if uh, the uh, answer is nothing then maybe uh, uh, to order some books uh, from Amazon.com and just provide those books to the teachers uh, and have some open discussions on what is actually this life 3.0 of Max Tegmark about, or why physicists and quantum physicists are discussing the world of artificial intelligence, and how actually is that now the cyber criminals attacking multiple companies at once? I mean, they are not doing this uh, with human force. They are doing this with machine learning algorithms. So our world is interconnected not just because we are in connectivity of all those 4G and now 5G is coming. Our world is in interconnected but because everything has to do with everything. And they are so huge interdependencies. Um, I think it's very valuable to learn from other disciplines. Uh, for example, um, in biology, um, in uh, genomic research, uh, you listen a lot to scientists who are talking about CRISPR and uh, genetic engineering. And I mean, this is something which, which is huge uh, for the whole humanity. And AI is so huge for the whole humanity. And they are dealing maybe with the same set of issues. If we do uh, CRISPR, what does it mean uh, for our decision making? Uh, if we, for example, are parents and we know that our child who is unborn right now will be disabled or we just want this child to be maybe uh, uh, black but have blue eyes. I mean, um, in theory, everything is possible, but what should be allowed? Should it, this decision be made by a single person or should maybe community society have a say in uh, developing the set of rules? 
how do they think about this stuff? And this thinking might be transferred even into AI thinking because once again, everything has to do with everything and our planet is just too small to, uh, let's say, live uh, in a kind of silos uh, and then islands, one island uh, for regulatory work for telecom operator, another island for regulatory work for financial services companies, everything is interrelated and technology is just a common uh, tool for our society and our humanity to, to live. And uh, unfortunately, uh, in this world, there will be uh, uh, some companies and some people who will prosper and some, some companies, uh, some uh, people will uh, lose and for those we need decisions too. Um, many of my friends in Silicon Valley uh, believe in uh, universal basic income. So we are here in Geneva, we are in Switzerland. You had a referendum uh, on universal uh, basic income in a couple of years ago with a negative result but the yeah. discussion is still uh, to be continued. Maybe companies need something like a universal basic whatever uh, income whatever the term is uh, for uh, their employees, if they can't be retrained uh, for what is coming uh, there. I don't know, I don't have all the answers, uh, but uh, I'm just giving certain insights uh, and impulses uh, and uh, pledge uh, for a more robust uh, connectivity um, among our uh, ecosystem, uh, which uh, combines so many industries, so many technologies. So do you think that this forum, uh, this, uh, this symposium, well, I'll, I'll say that one, one more time. So do you think that this uh, symposium is a good platform to be airing these thoughts and uh, to be sharing these thoughts with regulators as well as all sorts of the other people, the industry, et cetera, who they're gathered here? I think, s I think that this group can grow. Uh, it's already a, a very fine, diverse group, just looking at the faces, uh, all kind of skin color. We might get more diverse in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, age. We should uh, accept input of people who are, let's say, uh, below uh, 25 uh, or even above uh, 65 because those are members of our society too and uh, the technology impacts their life too. So uh, I believe that as a platform, this is a fantastic place, but it has to evolve uh, while incorporating uh, new nuances uh, of what is going on in the world. Uh, certain teams are always the same. Uh, how to fight the inequality? Uh, what kind of choices will individual states uh, take uh, to f actually uh, fight this inequality. How do we uh, go after the private sector? How do we go after dialogue? This is nothing new, but technology maybe accelerates uh, certain developments. And I believe with more technology literacy among regulators, uh, there will be a better understanding in, in how to speak this common language, <laughs> which will incorporate element of technology and not just, let's say, law um, and uh, usual social policy. Anastasia Latterback, thank you very much indeed for being with us today. Thank you so much for having me. It's a privilege. And we hope to catch up with you again some stage in the future. Oh, yes, absolutely. <laughs> and do check out our videos on the ITU YouTube channel and more of our podcasts on the ITU SoundCloud channel as well. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay.